Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Ben Powers coming at you from the Commander's Voice. My guest today is Mr. Andrew Waters, and he's the author of a book called To the End of the World. And it is about the American Revolution in South Carolina, specifically what an event called the Race to the Dan, when the British Army was chasing a force of uh, continental soldiers and rebel militia from the, the Calpins region of South Carolina out towards the Dan River, and then finally the, the main Continental Army in the Carolinas, and we'll get to all of that. For my regular listeners, you know we usually talk World War II and we talk airborne. This is a, a special opportunity to kind of expand our aperture, talk about another aspect of military history. It does have a fantastic tie-in to Fort Bragg in the 82nd, just because this all these events take place in the Carolinas. Every paratrooper knows that Fort Bragg is the home of the airborne, if you're stationed down there, or you live around there, there's so many elements of American history that just do not get advertised. You can go Kings Mountain, Battlefield, Cowpens, Guilford Courthouse, Camden, and they're, they're not really advertised to the degree that they should be. And hopefully this podcast can spread a little information and give folks an opportunity to go check out these aspects of history. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and welcome Andrew to the show. Andrew, thank you for being with us today. Ben, thank you for having me. I'm uh, thrilled to um, have the opportunity to talk to you about this book. Awesome. So as I kind of indicated to you when we were talking before the recording, I grew up in Boston and we act like we own the American Revolution up there. We get really focused on Lexington and Concord and the, the you know Boston Tea Party and all that exciting stuff. But there's this entire aspect, the second half of the American Revolution, almost anything that happens after 1778, the focus really shifts to the what's called the Southern Theater uh, and the, the British emphasis on a Southern campaign. And a lot of folks don't know about it. It gets brushed over in popular histories. So I'd like to really start with just a brief overview where you can kind of lay out what the, the Southern campaign was, the broad strokes, and then we can start talking more about the focus of the book itself. Okay. Well, just for starters, you know, I'm a native North Carolinian um, and moved to South Carolina in 2013. And, and even as a, as a native North North Carolinian, I was not aware of a lot of the American Revolution that happened in the South and particularly in South Carolina. So um, that was kind of my, my interest in all of this and kind of uh, deciding to pursue this, um, to, to write about it um, in a couple of books now. So um, the, the Southern uh, campaigns, um, you, I guess the action in my book really picks up with the invasion of Charleston in 1780. Now, this was actually the second time the British had tried to take um, Charleston. They, they had tried unsuccessfully in 1776. Um, Henry Clinton um, had um, directed that uh, attack as well, that attempted um, invasion of Charleston um, unsuccessfully. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the, um, the, the Fort Moultrie, um, which played such an important role in that first attack where the, the, the fort's walls made out of the palmetto tree repelled the British cannonballs. And that's why we have the palmetto tree on our state flag in South Carolina. Um, but now we're moving up about five years to 1780 and Clinton comes back. Um, the, the British ministry um, in England was really trying to figure out a way to kind of bring the conflict to an end, try to force some kind of decisive act. Um, and they were hearing from a lot of their, you know, the, these kind of royal um, appointees and sycophants that had wound up in London during the war were telling them that the South was really um, there was this very strong contingent of loyalists here who really just were kind of needed the British army to come back and then they would kind of rise up and, and help the British retake control of the South. And the idea was that if they could control the South and kind of push up into the North um, from, their, from a, a base in the South, they could bring Washington to some kind of decisive conflict or, or perhaps um, be able to negotiate some kind of end of the war with Congress. Um, so this was all part of what they called the Southern strategy and it really began 
um, with this, uh, this successful effort to take Charleston in May of 1780. Now Clinton um, went back to New York City, went back to the British headquarters in New York City and left Charles Cornwallis basically in control of the British um, occupation force here in South Carolina. Um, and Cornwallis um, was really committed to this idea of kind of pushing up through the North, into North Carolina and into Virginia, um, probably more so than Clinton. Clinton um, kind of went back and forth on whether he believed that was a good strategy or not, but, but Cornwallis was, was committed to it for a couple of reasons. Um, but first, he had to kind of subdue South Carolina. And um, that's really kind of the background to, to this book. Um, the, the loyalist um, support that they had been promised never really materialized. And in fact, um, the, the Patriot resistance kind of reorganized um, during the course of the summer and was giving Cornwallis um, quite a bit of problems. And and this is when we see the rise of Thomas Sumter um, and later on Francis Marion, who of course are the great South Carolina partisan generals, the, the Gamecock and the Swamp Fox. Um, and Sumter in particular had been very successful throughout the course of the summer. Um, and then Gates, Horatio Gates, the hero of Saratoga, who had been sent down to the um, take control of the Continental Army, the remnants of the Continental Army after Charleston, because quite a bit of it had been captured at Charleston, but some of it had kind of reorganized in, in North Carolina and they sent Gates down um, to take command of those forces. Gates gathered a, a fairly significant militia body and, and with this body, he decided to attack Camden, South Carolina. And that's um, a really interesting point of departure that I kind of want to get to because you bring up Sumter, you bring up Marion, you also have Andrew Pickens, you have all these, like you say, great partisan leaders, but you've a lot of folks when I, in the histor historiographies that I've examined, uh, they talk about maybe one third of the population is going to be really staunchly pro independence. A third is going to be staunchly pro loyalist. And then you got a third that just is not, as long as their life is going okay, they're not really caring who's in charge. So this is a, a time of some really, you know, great tension because Cornwallis is on a roll after the fall of Charleston. Gates is coming down to kind of reconstitute the regular forces. You've got an active partisan uh, backcountry war going on between patriots and loyalists. So it's almost anyone's ball game at this point. And this is where Gates commits uh, a pretty tremendous tactical error that's going to have some strategic implications. And if you, if you could talk about Camden and what happens to the Continental Army and how that sets the story for your book, that would be very cool. Yeah. And please keep me on track here, Ben, because I can go off on some tangents um, with this stuff. Uh, and I know we've only got a limited amount of time. Um, so Gates, uh, you know, kind of, you know, the classic um, military strategy of the time um, decides to, you know, launch this large scale attack against Camden, which was really the key to the northern frontier of South Carolina. It, it was on what they called the Wagon Road, which was the main north-south artery coming down all the way from Pennsylvania into South Carolina. So it was very important strategically. Um, but in, to, in, to make a long story short, this, disaster, this attack was a disaster. Um, Gates was relying mostly on um, militia um, that he had never really kind of um, operated with or had any kind of opportunity to, to train or drill um, in the face of um, mostly British regulars. Cornwallis had a little bit over 2,000 men with him at Camden. Most of them were British regulars. Um, the militia um, 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 panicked and fled the battlefield. Um, Gates claimed that he was kind of caught up in this tide of escaping militia Meanwhile, the, the Continentals um, were kind of left to their own device under um, uh, the Baron de Kalb, 
um, who was um, a European soldier um, who had uh, taken a role in the Continental Army and was killed at Camden. Um, Gates flees uh, Camden in disgrace. He rides away from Hills, uh, from Camden all the way to Hillsborough, North Carolina, and basically leaves his men on the field of battle to, be, to die or to be captured. Um, so going into the fall of 1780, the Continental Army was really in disarray. I'd like to ask you a question here too, uh, just because your book brings this out really well. The, the idea that Gates, you know, the hero of Saratoga, like you said, he's considered, you know, the second soldier of the Continental Army behind Washington because of that reputation. Uh, we're not going to debate whether that was deserved or undeserved in this podcast. That could be another one, perhaps. But the idea in 18th century warfare that you put your best troops in a position of honor on the right of the line, and as a former royal officer, he'd been a British officer prior to emigrating to the colonies, he puts his strong continental forces on the right of his line. He's got his militia on the left, not even thinking that Cornwallis had the same training and background. So his stronger troops are going to be on the right of his line, and he's putting his green militia directly opposite probably the most professional, you know, brigade of guards guys uh, across the line. And you would think that with that level of experience at that point in the war, maybe a little more creative thinking rather than just slavishly adhering to what passed for the doctrine of the time, that if he had leavened his line with a little bit more, uh, strength on his left, maybe Camden would have played out differently. But you've got a guy who is so stuck in the ways things quote unquote were supposed to be, he set the stage for his own own disaster. And the reason I wanted to emphasize that is it's going to be such a contrast later when we start talking about the the American heroes of your book. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, Gates, had been selected by the Continental Congress. And after the disaster at Camden, Congress basically let George Washington pick who he had wanted to pick, uh, whoever he wanted to pick to replace Gates. And, and Washington had always wanted Nathaniel Green. And um, Nathaniel Green um, was um, one of Washington's most trusted officers, one of his most trusted generals. But he had just come out of this kind of troublesome appointment as the quartermaster general for the army. And, um, you know, some of his operations um, in the quartermaster's office were being questioned by members of Congress. Um, and he had kind of entered into some kind of unfortunate spats and feuds with Congress. And his his reputation was really kind of had taken a nosedive at this period. Um, but Washington, um, you know, had fought with Green throughout the war. He, he, he trusted Green. He knew Green was a man of great capability. And he appointed Green to replace Gates as commander of the Southern Department. Now, in the meantime, um, Daniel Morgan had, had also come been appointed to the Southern Department. Morgan, of course, had fought with Gates and at Saratoga, and um, Gates had actually requested that Morgan join him when he took command of the Southern Department. Now, now Morgan was kind of in a dispute with the Continental Army he, because uh, he felt like he hadn't been um, promoted um, the, the way that he should have been. So it took him a while to get down to the South. He actually wasn't at Camden, but he came during the course of the fall and started operating with the more mobile units of the Continental Army. Um, and this is essentially what would become um, the flying, the famous flying army um, that Green detached to the, the Western part of South Carolina um, in late December of 1780. Uh, just after he'd taken command of the Southern Department. Now, I'm not a, I usually don't ascribe to the idea that, you know, great events pivot on great men kind of thing, but I, you can't look at this story and not think you've got an amazing strategist in green 
probably the best combat commander in Morgan. And these two gentlemen are, arrive in the theater within you know, two or three months of each other at a time when the Continental Patriot forces are, are kind of at a low ebb. Because after Camden, Cornwallis is riding high. He's still got to subdue partisans. He's still got to deal with some unrest. But he's feeling like he's got South Carolina pretty much under control. And he, as you indicated earlier, he, he had a, a very offensive mindset. He wants to move into North Carolina and get up into Virginia. And he's feeling like he might be able to start launching that campaign. And it, it now is a time I want to address your background as a conservationist rather than a writer or historian, your understanding of the terrain of the areas these guys are going to be operating in and how that's going to affect the story. Yeah, so um, that's right. Uh, I have worked mostly in my professional career as a um, land conservationist. I've worked at three different nonprofit land trusts here in the Carolinas. Um, and the first one I worked at was called the Catawba Lands Conservancy, which is in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it's focused on the Catawba River Basin. Then I went to work at a land trust in Salisbury, North Carolina, which is right on the on the Yadkin River, and that's really focused on the Yadkin PD River Basin. And then when I moved to Spartanburg, um, the land trust, uh, the Spartanburg Conservancy was really focused on the Broad River Basin and the Packlet River Basin. Um, so, you know, as a conservationist, we look at rivers in a kind of a strategic way. We're trying to connect different pieces of property, um, trying to create kind of corridors of conserved areas. Um, you know, we do a lot with mapping, with GIS, kind of looking at, at, at river basins um, kind of as a system or as a whole. Um, so as I was, you know, starting to get interested in all of um, all of this in the Southern campaign, and and really starting to do some serious research on green, um, let me just mention this, this. This is actually my my second book. Um, I actually have written another book um, called The Quaker and the Gamecock, which is specifically about the relationship between Thomas Sumter and Nathaniel Green. Um, but anyway, the, the, the two stories kind of overlap. Anyway, as I was researching this book, I started reading a lot of Green's correspondence. Um, and I just started realizing um, that Green was kind of studying these river basins um, in a very kind of methodical and strategic way. And that, um, that interests me because I, I, I felt like he was, the way he was looking at the river basins, you know, not exactly the same. He was more concerned with transporting goods and, you know, places where the armies are, where he could cross the rivers, how to get across the river, how to move through this terrain. terrain. But it was similar. It was, a, it was a strategic focus on a river basin. Um, and I just was very impressed with kind of, um, the meticulousness and the degree to which he had, um, the, the effort to which he put into this, um, these surveys. So even before he had arrived in Charlotte in December, he had, had commissioned these, um, these expeditions, these studies of these, these river basins that he expected to be operating in. So he had sent men out um, on the the Dan River, um, which is a, a tributary of the Roanoke River, um, which was very important kind of for the strategic crossing between North Carolina and Virginia. Um, and he had done the same thing for um, the Yadkin PD River, which really runs right through the middle of um, North Carolina into South Carolina, and also um, the Catawba River. Um, which was really um, kind of playing an important role in the, in the South Carolina occupation. That Camden is, is basically located right on the Catawba River. And, and all throughout the summer, the, the forces were crossing back and forth over the Catawba kind of strategically. Um, and I, I don't want to belabor the point, but it's so important for everybody to remember there's the, 
when you want to talk about a strategic network, the rivers are it at this period of time. Is that not right? There's no, the Grand Wagon Road does not really deserve the name Grand. And that's <laughs> probably the only real road. There's no true road network. So if you're moving large bodies of uh, supplies, if you're trying to move troops across a large uh, swath of terrain quickly, understanding the river networks, controlling the river networks are critical. And uh, rivers can also be used as obstacles if you are in a position to defend. So this knowledge of the river network is critical to understanding the military topography of the region. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm not as much of an expert in the, the Northeastern um, kind of part of the American Revolution, but it's my understanding that even at that time, you know, the roads and, and bridges in the Northeast where most of the fighting had occurred before were, were, were superior to what the, what the British encountered in the South. In the South, you know, there were no bridges. So basically you either had to ford a river or you had to ferry the river. Um, and one of the things that, um, some of the information that Green was collecting that, um, you know, he was even collecting information about, okay, how, how long after a, a major rain event can I still ford a river? Um, and that actually ended up playing a very significant role um, in a couple of the events that occur um, during the race to the dam because he knew that he had a certain amount of time to get his men across the river before it would become unfordable. And if he could get all the boats, then he could keep the British on the opposite side of the river um, as a strategic deterrent. And that's a great setup for my, my next series of questions because we've got We've introduced Green and Morgan. We've got a reconstituted Continental Army, but not reconstituted to make it sound like it had a lot of combat power. It was concentrated. It was definitely not reconstituted. These guys, even a few months later, are still reeling from Camden, but they've got new, a fresh infusion of strategic and tactical leadership. On the British side, Cornwallis, although his army's small, 2,000 guys, it is an elite formation. He's got this very strong regular infantry. He's got Tarleton's Legion, which is a combined arms cavalry infantry formation that had a ferocious reputation. He feels like he's got South Carolina under control. He's ready to move north. And now we have an understanding of the topography. So what, what the, now we get to the, the heart of the book, the importance of the river. So I'm just gonna let you tell your story now. Well, you know, interrupt me if I'm going on too long. Um, so Green gets to Charlotte and he, he sees that he, he can't, he can't stop Cornwallis. He doesn't have the manpower to, to oppose Cornwallis. So he, he does a very uh, interesting thing. Um, and you probably know more about this than I do, but you know, it was a maxim of the time that you, you're not supposed to split your inferior force in the face of a superior force. So kind of went against military protocol, um, but he decided to split his army um, and he sends Morgan and this, this flying army, which were basically his light troops, his mounted troops and his more experienced um, continental soldiers um, across the broad river into Western South Carolina. Meanwhile, he takes kind of his regulars, what's left of his army, I think it was about 1300 men, not a lot, um, down to the Chiraws on the PD. So he kind of, he splits his force um, and kind of kind of gives Cornwallis, a, in, in essence, he's given Cornwallis a free lane up into North Carolina, but, but it's not quite that simple because um, now he's got more, now Cornwallis has Morgan on his left flank or his west flank and Green on his right flank or his east flank and he can't really leave those flanks unprotected um, because on his east flank, he's got Charleston and on his west flank, he's got a place called 96. Now 96 was the most important um, kind of strategic outpost on the Western frontier. Um, and it's interesting, we don't have a lot of time to go into the sociology of South Carolina, but. Actually, this was where probably the most ardent loyalist support was in South Carolina was in this region around um, 96. So 
for kind of both strategic and political reasons, he couldn't really afford to leave 96 undefended. Um, so he's preparing this invasion. He's waiting on some reinforcements. Really, he's just waiting on reinforcements to kind of start moving into North Carolina. But in the meantime, Morgan's on his west flank threatening 96. And he does his best to try to ignore the threat. Um, but ultimately kind of the political pressure gets to him. And there's this skirmish at this place called Hammond Store. And all of a sudden, everyone in Western South Carolina is worried about the security of 96. There's kind of rumors swirling through the countryside that Morgan's getting ready to attack 96. Um, and Cornwallis decides to put an end to all of this. He's going to send Bannister Tarleton, um, his most talented cavalry officer, um, still a very young man at this point. I think he was 25 or 26 at this point, but had had, had a very successful war um, and basically give Tarleton all of his best light troops, all of his mounted troops, his, his light infantry, and kind of push Morgan from his flank and the plan was for Tarleton and Cornwallis to kind of come up into North Carolina together, pushing Morgan um, out of the way, pushing Morgan back um, to the east. And this is really the setup for the Battle of Cowpens. And, and this, is, this is where I start my story of the race to the Dan. Now, if you if you pick up a kind of a standard history of the American Revolution, usually the race to the Dan is kind of defined by this period of February 11th, 1781 to February 15th, just very the last part of this campaign where the British are pushing the Continentals from Guilford Courthouse up near present day Greensboro, North Carolina, across the Dan River. Um, but because I'm here in Western South Carolina and I had really studied, you know, was thinking about this campaign in terms of the way the rivers were, were playing a role in all of this. And also because I felt like it made for a better book. You know, I couldn't just write a book about the last four days of this. I wanted to expand the, the perspective of it a little bit. Um, I framed the Battle of Calpins really as the beginning of the race to the Dan. And what happened at Calpins was um, Tarleton, uh, Morgan understood that Tarleton was pursuing him. Um, he, he, he leaves his base at a place called Grindle Shoals on the Packlet River, and he's retreating kind of north by northeast up towards the Broad River. Um, and as he's retreating, he's, he's gathering Patriot militia with him. Um, so by the night of, um, I'm not great on date, I think Calpins was January 19th, is that right? I believe it was January 17th, sir. January 17th, okay, the night of, night of January 16th, Morgan comes to this place called the Calpins, which was a place where the, um, the settlers of that time would, would drive their cattle and their livestock and collect their livestock. So it was kind of an open grassy field. It had, it was but kind of intermittent with some trees, um, but it was a plain really. Um, and Morgan understands two things. Um, a, he understands that if he goes ahead and retreats across the broad river, that the militia that he had with him would kind of intuitively understand that he wasn't going to stop to fight the British. And then they would just scatter. They would go back to their homes. They would kind of, kind of leave the army. Um, and he would lose any opportunity that he had to, to fight Tarleton if he crossed the river. He also saw on this, this Calpin's plain um, some some aspects of the topography that he could use to his advantage. The, the plane kind of had some, some dips and swales and he realized that he could place his men kind of strategically um, along this, this field um, to kind of 
uh, essentially draw Tarleton into a trap. He could place his skirmishers up at the front of the field and Tarleton could see the skirmishers, but he couldn't, wouldn't be able to see the rest of the men kind of hiding behind the, the hills um, further up on the field. Um, and by this time also, the Americans really, they'd had several encounters with Tarleton by this time and they understood um, that his, his, uh, his strategy was the, the charge. You know, he was a cavalry officer. He was trained to, to just overwhelming force, kind of charge the enemy, um, terrify them, subdue them, scatter them. That was kind he, of- He was all about, you know, shock, not as much about firepower. And to put it into modern parlance for my, my viewers and listeners, he, Tarleton was kind of the master of the meeting engagement. Okay. If you came upon a, a, an enemy force, he would move quickly to get the upper hand. He wouldn't wait. He wouldn't assume defensive positions. His attack was his default mode. Precisely. And this is exactly what he did at Calpins. Um, This is exactly what Morgan kind of anticipated that he would do. Um, and Morgan, um, you know, in addition to being, you know, very talented uh, officer, um, he really had kind of the, the, a common touch. He really was able to kind of create an affinity um, with his men. He was born from, from humble circumstances. So, you know, it wasn't like he was some kind of um, aristocrat or, or rich, uh, you know, city guy leading these forces. He, he was really leading men that, that he knew and understand from, from growing up in these kind of environments. So, he was, he, he was really able to motivate um, his forces. Um, his, his strategy was impeccable. He, he essentially had three lines and Tarleton, he kind of kept drawing Tarleton deeper and deeper into his, um, his um, infantry lines. Um, and of course, uh, it, it was, it was a, complete victory for the Americans. I think Tarleton escaped with something like 150 to 200 of his men, but basically he lost about 700 men in addition to his artillery, all his supplies. It was, it was really a disaster um, for uh, both Tarleton and the British forces and really influenced um, Cornwallis's invasion plans. Um, yes, sir. And I'd like to just jump in here real quick, because like you said, this is the most complete tactical victory that the Patriots have during the war in, in either the Northern or, or Southern uh, theater. And the, I think what's so neat about Morgan, as you kind of pointed out, in today's parlance, he's what the, the troops would call a Mustang, you know, a, a sort of a, an officer who's risen from the ranks. During the French and Indian War, he had been a, you know, a a, a teamster, a wagoneer, and then he had served as a, a, a private in a ranger company. He, he got a commission as what they called an ensign back then. And then Revolutionary War, he gets a commission as a captain, gets promoted to colonel, ultimately brigadier general. Right. And, he, and he has so much combat experience, not only from the French and Indian War, but he, he's in the Northern Theater from day one, the invasion of Canada, the skirmishing around Morristown in early 1777, the Battle of Saratoga. He takes a hiatus after Saratoga, but then he's down in the, the Southern Theater in time to fight a Cowpin. So he's just probably the most broadly experienced field commander in the right place at the right time. And uh, at the risk of belaboring it, a comparison of both Green and Morgan to Gates. Gates' downfall comes from slavish adherence to arraying his forces the way they always do it, whereas Green and Morgan are both having success by not worrying about, oh, we shouldn't separate our forces. Oh, we should not put militia out towards the front. They think about their enemy. They think about how to best use what they have to create a tactical dilemma or a strategic dilemma for their enemy and they experienced some stunning success. And uh, the comparison and the contrast is amazing to me. Yeah, one of the things I talk about in the book and um, you know, you touched on a little bit, um, Morgan um, was, was very adept at kind of mixing uh, the, the rifle um, into the military tactics, um, which he had done um, in New Jersey in 1977 um, and then and again at Saratoga, um, and he had really kind of perfected these tactics of kind of 
having his his regulars with their muskets in the center of his formations, but they were supported on the flanks um, by his riflemen who were who were able who were more accurate and and really able to kind of give cover and support to his his regular um, regular troops with the muskets. Yes, sir. So c coming back to the narrative, because I, I'm, I'm a, I want to make sure that we don't oversell how important Cowpens was. I mean, it's great. The guts are ripped out of the British Legion. They've affected a lot of British combat power. But Cornwallis still has a very powerful, very professional force. And once he hears about what happens at Cowpens, he's a little little angry now. <laughs> and, he, and he still has the uh, the strategic upper hand. And this is where the race to the Dan is going to start gaining a momentum. So if you could pick up the narrative thread. Yeah, absolutely. So so Cornwallis hears about um, Calpens. He's, as you said, he's furious. There's one account where um, an American supposedly observed Tarleton telling Cornwallis about what happened. And Cornwallis is supposedly leaning on his sword. And as Tarleton's report kind of continues, the sword snaps in half. Um, you know, we, we're, we're not sure if that's 100% true, but it's too good of a story not to include. Um, but anyway, you know, Cornwallis, um, he wanted to get these prisoners back. Um, and he, once he hears this news, he kind of, um, expedites his plans. He sets out um, into North Carolina. Um, he's finally got his reinforcements. He sets out into North Carolina, but, but his plans are really disrupted at this point um, because he's going on a different route uh, to try to get the prisoners. Um, and um, obviously his, the complexion of his, his army has has changed due to this um, disastrous defeat and um, and I talk about it in the book I, I think that um, you know the fact that things weren't going his way really kind of disrupted his uh, his thinking a little bit and he wasn't quite as decisive or as clear as he probably needed to be or could have been at this point in the in the campaign, but he decides to, to move up into North Carolina on a more westerly route to try to recapture these, these prisoners, Morgan's prisoners. This fails and he actually kind of gets lost in the countryside. Um, and again, you know, whereas Green had put all this effort into kind of mapping the terrain and, and learning about um, what the, the ground that he was getting ready to operate in, we don't really see that kind of effort in Cornwallis. They were really relying on their, you know, their loyalist informants um, for this kind of information. We don't really have a lot of evidence that he really put much effort into to scouting or, or, or mapping uh, beside what he already, already had. So he gets lost and because of this delay, Morgan is able to cross the Catawba River. Um, and he's able to get his prisoners all up to safety. They're, they're on their way up into Virginia. Um, and he stops at, this, at the Catawba River. Um, and Cornwallis arrives a few days later and he realizes basically that he's lost um, the prisoners um, that that he, he can no longer kind of get these men back and his, his, his plans start to change a little bit. And, he, and at this point, he's really trying to adapt. He's adapting to, to Morgan and, and Green, not the other way around. And you would think it would be the other way around because he had the superior forces, um, but he's really discombobulated and, and Green and Morgan have really kind of, um, you know, cause some disorganization and confusion in his ranks. But what he does is he gets to this place called Ramsor's Mill. Um, and, you know, part of the reasons that he wasn't able to, to catch Morgan before 
the Catawba was because he had all had all his wagons. He had you know a lot of followers, a lot of um, um, some uh, camp followers, a lot of women um, were traveling with him. All his baggage. Um, so he kind of he stages this dramatic bonfire at at Ramsor's Mill, um, where they're gonna they're gonna burn all of their baggage so that they can can move quickly enough to, to catch the Continentals. And according to one of the accounts that we have um, from Charles O'Hara, who was the commander of the British guards that you mentioned earlier, um, it's Cornwallis who is the first to kind of throw his baggage onto this fire to kind of um, inspire his troops to, to move forward and catch the Continental Army. Um, now, as all of this was going on, Green learns about um, Cowpens, and, and he rides across the Carolinas with just a very small number of, of guards, I think three or four guards, and he arrives at the Catawba River where um, the Flying Army, where Morgan's men are, are camped, or kind of defending the eastern side of the river. Morgan, during all of this time, um, his health was really deteriorating rapidly. It had been, you know, wet, cold winter. He had um, sciatica, um, some kind of nerve issue in his back. Apparently he was also suffering from a bad case of hemorrhoids and he was really kind of um, not able to carry on. So at this point, Green kind of takes command um, of the American forces at the Catawba River. Um, and they're bringing in the militia from the Mecklenburg and Rowan parts of North Carolina. This is kind of a different set of militia than they were working with in, in at Calpens, which was more of the Western South Carolina, some Georgia militia, a few North Carolinians. Um, but this is, this is all North Carolina militia. Um, and Green sends Morgan and his men to cross the Yadkin River at Salisbury. And he decides to defend the Catawba River with his militia troops. He wants to get his, his Continentals to safety. And he's going to stop. He's going to try to stop the British with his militia forces at the Catawba River. So this leads to, um, you know, what you might call a bad, the Battle of Cowan's Ford, um, which was fought on February 1, 1781. Um, after this bonfire, Cornwallis uh, finally gets his troops together and they, they decide to cross the river at a place called Cowan's Ford, which was not one of the main fords on the Catawba River, but actually Green, because he had kind of done all this homework, he deduced that that's where Cornwallis would attempt to cross. He, he actually was able to kind of figure out that that's probably the place where Cornwallis was, would cross. There's this famous kind of scene that I talk about in the book. Um, Green arrives on the Catawba River and he's sitting there and they're, they're having a conference with um, with Morgan and also this militia officer called named William Davidson, who's the namesake of Davidson College, which is a, a very nice school here in the Carolinas. Um, he was the commander of the American militia. And Davidson later remarked that although Green had never seen the Catawba River before, he, he appeared to know more about it than someone who was born um, on the river. Um, That's awesome. So, uh, so the, the British get up early, first light, February 1. They start to ford um, the Catawba River, and they're met by this patriot resistance um, under Davidson. Um, the, the, the British do get across. They, they take some pretty heavy casualties. But as they're crossing, they manage to kill Davidson. Um, and once Davidson dies, the, the Patriot uh, resistance on the Catawba kind of crumbles and they, they um, fade back into the, um, the countryside. Um, so the British 
now they're across the Catawba River. Um, you know, they burned all their baggage. It's been raining the whole time. They, they just got sniped at um, while marching across a, a, a river in the middle of nowhere in North Carolina, and they're pretty pissed. They're, pre <laughs> they're, pretty, they're pretty mad at this time. Um, so there's a couple of things that go on. Um, Tarleton kind of goes into the countryside. He, he conducts a raid at this place called Torrance's Tavern. Um, meanwhile, Cornwallis and the rest of the British are kind of marching behind him. And really, this is one of the times in the in the Southern campaign um, when, you know, what we think of or what I think of as as total warfare. Um, the countryside is in disarray. There's really no kind of um, military or, or civil authority. Um, the British are mad. The Americans are fleeing and the British, it was wet. And so Cornwallis usually required his men to march in formation on the road, but because the roads were so terrible, they were so muddy, he allowed his men to kind of march out in a line of the roads. And as you can imagine, um, with, with little oversight, um, they're really doing quite a bit of destruction as they cross through the, the, this part of North Carolina and they're, they're burning houses. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a scene I stole from another historian named Burke Davis where the, you know, they're, the British are just marching across central North Carolina with the, with the smoke just kind of pluming up behind them as they kind of march through the countryside. Um, See, what I find fascinating about th this point in the campaign now, as you've indicated, is Green's really gotten inside of Cornwallis's head now. He has this, this formation that he had all the way down South Carolina. Again, I, I want to stress small but elite. He's got a plan to launch this offensive, and now he's just myopically focused on getting Green. And, and he's, he's now he's not thinking about his broader strategic plan. He's, he's like a a heavyweight boxer throwing punches and missing and while getting stung and jabbed by his opponent and, and really dancing to Green's tune. And it, at this point, it, it doesn't even matter if Green's winning tactically. As long as he can keep the focus on himself, he's attriting them down, like you said, Cowan's forward, they're sniping him. He's making Cornwallis burn his baggage. They're exposed to the elements. It, it's really the, almost a level of psychological warfare at this point. It doesn't matter almost what's happening tactically because Cornwallis is not focused on strategy anymore. He's focused on revenge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's interesting to, you know, just further on that point, you know, the strategy was to march into North Carolina and the kind of galvanize the countryside around the British army. You know, here we are, we're the, we're the force of, of authority, of kind of, and we're gonna restore, um, you know, the regular governance. Um, but it, because they were reacting to green, all of that had gone out the window and now they're, they're destroying the countryside, they're, you know, they're raiding homes. Um, clearly, this was not kind of the propaganda um, campaign that, that Cornwallis had envisioned for this, this part of the campaign, this, this move into North Carolina. He's, you know, he's undermining his, his, um, his reputation at this point in the, in the campaign. But as you said, at this, by this point, he had decided that, that he, he had to to catch and, uh, and hopefully destroy Green in order to pacify North Carolina. And this, this the strategy had really switched um, to trying to catch Nathaniel Green um, and the Continental Army. Um, you know, the, I, this was a part, one part, part of the story that I was really fascinated in because I, as I had said earlier, I had lived in Salisbury, North Carolina for about eight years doing some conservation work. And I, I didn't know any of this. I had no idea that all of this um, American Revolution history had occurred. You know, basically the, 
these armies had marched right up the road that my house was about a block and a half away from this road they'd been marching on. And I really didn't know very much about it at all. I talk in the introduction of the book about how a guy I had worked with told me this story about Nathaniel Green kind of riding into Salisbury in the middle of the night. Um, you know, he hadn't been able to kind of rally the, the militia forces and he, he rides into Salisbury and he's all by himself. Um, and, and, you know, he, there's, a, there's an American doctor at this tavern that he ends up at and the, the doctor is incredulous and you know, can't understand why the, the commander of the American forces is, is showing up in Salisbury in the middle of the night all by himself. Um, but, you know, this, things were, were in flux. This, things were, um, you know, there, there wasn't any real order at this point. Um, so Green reunites with the, the Continentals in Salisbury. They're able to get the boats that they had collected there and cross the Yadkin River. This is the point Green knew it had it had rained um, the actually the night of Cowan's Ford and Green knew because of this survey that he had conducted that within three days of a heavy rain the Yadkin was could could not be forded. So he knew if he could get across the Yankton River and get all the boats on the other side that again, Cornwallis will be pinned on the west, the southwest side of the Yankton River and he wouldn't be able to get at the Continental Army on the northeast side. And, and so that's what happens. Um, the, the, the last part of the Americans are, are literally kind of crossing over the river as the British vanguard pulls up to the Yadkin River and kind of can see the Americans on the other side, but there's really nothing they can do to get at them. Um, they do start opening up with their artillery. They're just kind of so furious. They're just, they just fire their cannons at the Americans kind of ineffectually for the next couple of hours. But, but again, um, because Green um, had, um, you know, done all this research, he knew the way that the river behaved, um, he had kind of inventoried all the boats, um, he was able to get across the river and, and, and use this knowledge of the terrain of the rivers um, to, to escape um, Cornwallis's forces yet again. And this continues to play out because as, as we know, we're talking about the race to the Dan and that we're, we're still heading in that direction, heading north towards the Dan River. But the, it's, the strategy is, is obviously working, but it's, it, it's cyclic. It, you cross one river, there's going to be another one to cross. You got to stay ahead of Cornwallis. That's right. Now, um, I don't know how much, how much more time do we have? We've got about 10 minutes left. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll try to move forward pretty pretty quickly. Um, Cornwallis again, because he he was relying on you know basically the, the loyalists to give him his intelligence. Um, he thought Green was headed towards the upper fords of the Dan, but in fact, Green again because he had done his homework, um, he had all he had collected all the boats on the lower fords of the Dan and um, decided to, to, instead of stopping to fight Cornwallis in North Carolina, he realized that he, he could never kind of marshal the, the forces that he needed, the local militia. Um, so, so once he gets to Guilford Courthouse, he decides to go ahead and retreat, continue the retreat into Virginia. Cornwallis moves up the other side of the Yadkin River. He still thinks he can cut off Green on the way to the, the upper fords. Um, and Green, actually, as he's leaving Guilford Court, Courthouse, he sends part of his army on a more northerly course um, in hopes of kind of continuing that deception. Um, but in fact, he heads kind of east northeast to the lower fords um, 
this is really, you know, kind of the traditional race to the dam that you'll read about in, in Ward or Buchanan or some of the, the, the American Revolution histories that are kind of canon. Um, but it's, it's, it's still, it's a neck and neck chase. Um, this part of the narrative, uh, of course, um, Light Horse Harry Lee, um, who was uh, one of Green's other kind of very talented officers um, who, had, who had just joined the Continentals kind of for this part of the campaign. Um, he kind of takes over defending the American rear guard. He has several skirmishes with the British. Um, there's another American officer, Otho Holland Williams, who kind of takes Morgan's place because Morgan by this time has left for Virginia. Um, so they're kind of skirmishing as they're retreating. Um, they're, you know, the, the, the misery has just kind of compounded at this point. Um, everyone's clothes had deteriorated, their shoes had, were, were practically um, disintegrated into nothing. There's, there's several accounts of kind of um, these, these roads that had frozen over in the night, cutting the men's feet as they marched north. Um, and then of course, as the day continued and the, the temperature warmed up, they would turn to mud. And they, so the men were you know, marching on these muddy roads and, and bloody bare feet. Um, there's one account of Green um, kind of waking up in the middle of the night and, and believing that there's a British soldier kind of in his camp, kind of walking through the camp in the middle of the night. Um, there's another account of Green. Um, he stopped, he's, he's got with him this guy named John Rutledge, who was the, the colonial governor of South Carolina. And they stop at this, you know, very meager, modest farmhouse and they, the, the farmer puts them up for the night and, and Green, in the middle of the night, Green tells Rutledge to quit kicking him so much and Rutledge tells Green to quit kicking him. And it turns out that the, the family hog has climbed into bed with them and it's the, it's the hog that's kicking them both. Um, but anyway, on the night of February 15th, um, really after this nonstop retreat, um, Green is able to get across the Dan. Um, he sends word to Williams and Lee that, that the, the bulk of the army is safe. You know, come on, come, come, come to the army and we're across the river, we're safe. So that night, the last of the American forces are able to escape across the Dan River. And again, Cornwallis can really do nothing. He can just kind of steer across the river and, and fume. And, and what's so amazing about this is from this major victory at Camden back in August, now it's February. So we're, we're talking five months later, you've got, you've brought them from South Carolina all the way up to the border of North Carolina and Virginia. You've retreated most of, or a large part of Cornwallis's combat power. You've ruined their propaganda message by the way they had to treat folks or determined they were gonna treat folks as they marched through North Carolina. You've kept your own forces in being and now they can truly safely reconstitute across the Dan River and then re-enter North Carolina because you know, by, by March of uh, 1781, you have a, a major battle at Guilford Courthouse again between Green and Cornwallis tactically Cornwallis wins, but it's going to be a strategic loss because more combat power gets attrited. He does not have the manpower anymore to launch a true offensive up into Virginia. He's lost control over South Carolina now because he spent, has spent so much time up in North Carolina. So he determines, well, I need to make my way up into Virginia and we're eventually going to try to evacuate, which by October of 1781 leads to them getting penned up on the Virginia Peninsula near Yorktown. We know that the British are defeated in the Battle of Yorktown and that contributes to the British decision to, you know, basically capitulate and by 1783 the war is over and you had this major strategic impact by Green who never won a major tactical victory at all. And I love the quote by him that hey, we fight, we get beat, but we rise and fight again. As long as he kept his forces together and kept baiting Cornwallis, they were winning strategically, even if they're losing tactically. Yeah, and I try to make that argument in the book. You know, it, 
it's it's not a direct argument that the race to the dam leads to um, Cornwallis's surrender at Yorktown. You know, you got to take a few leaps to get there, but certainly, um, you know, at the time, um, the the officers in the Continental Army understood, um, you know, essentially what you just explained that because Green had been able to totally disrupt Cornwallis's plans. It eventually led to the, the British surrender at Yorktown. And there's a great quote um, from Green. He said, um, you know, uh, we have beat the bush and Washington has caught the bird. Um, <laughs> so, awesome. so, you know, Green, I wouldn't say he was bitter about it, but, you know, as you said, he did have the reputation of, of, of having never won uh, a major battle, um, but really his his adaptation, his resilience, kind of his his strategic mind. Um, as I said before, it, it was it it had such a disruptive effect on Cornwallis um, that it, Cornwallis wasn't able to kind of implement his strategy. Uh, as he had envisioned it. No, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I uh, honestly, Andrew, I don't think it's a mental leap at all. I, I think because if Green loses the race to the Dan, he's not going to win tactically on the south side of that river if they if they have to go toe to toe. It much like Guilford Courthouse showed when he had a reconstituted force, you know, uh, about a month later, then he still wasn't able to win tactically. So if they'd gotten pinned south of the river and had been destroyed, that would have given Cornwallis the breathing room that he needed. And maybe the Southern campaign would have turned a different way because there was not going to be a way to reconstitute the Southern department for the Continentals. So I, I think Green's contribution is just invaluable. And yeah, he, uh, Green, you know, he, even as he was retreating from North Carolina, he, he was concerned because he knew that the, if he left North Carolina, the people of this, the, the state would, would, worry that the the americans the continental army were was deserting them but but he understood that his his primary mission his primary objective was to keep the continental army as a as a functioning um, um element in the in the campaign and if if the army was was you know, lost or significantly defeated, then then that would be the tragic consequence and, and would lead to the British being able to assert control. Yes, sir. Now we're, we're coming up at the end of time. I wanted to bring up a couple of things real quick. You indicated very succinctly during your discussion of the campaign and the race to the Dan that this was narrative was not very well preserved or told to the modern day inhabitants of uh, of the Carolinas. And a lot of this kind of came to a surprise to you as you were learning about the, the local war, as it were. But it's my understanding uh, the Carolinas and South Carolina in particular are taking steps to develop a more coherent narrative and, and help people understand just how critical the Southern states were during the American Revolution. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure thing. Well, I mean, so, you know, that's part of the, the reason that, that I got interested in this, because, you know, as a conservationist, we're not only interested in conserving important natural resources, we're also interested in, in preserving important historical resources and archaeological resources as well. And, you know, there's really, um, you know, been some very positive steps in that regard in the last um, few years. Um, before the taping started, we were talking about the American Battlefield Trust, and they recently kind of um, added the American Revolution into their um, strategic focus. They were previously really just more concerned with the Civil War, but now they're doing a lot more um, American Revolution conservation. Um, there's, there's several groups here in South Carolina um, that are doing a lot with um, preserving some of these places, um, also in North Carolina. Um, and actually here in South Carolina, you know, the, the 250th anniversary of all of this is coming up in a few years. Um, and they've put together a commission um, to really formally um, commemorate some of the, these um, 
events and, and kind of reintroduce some of this history to the, the people of the, the state. Um, they're working on a kind of a, an integrated um, kind of driving tour concept um, with, with associated marketing material to, to get people um, to come visit South Carolina, but also to, to introduce them to, to a lot of this history and to, to show them some of these really cool um, preserved places that we have in the Carolinas. As you said, um, you know, there's some great, really great um, battlefield sites here, the, the Calpen site, which is just up the road from me in Spartanburg, um, the Guilford Courthouse site. Of course, both of those are National Park Service, but there's several other, you know, state and locally preserved sites that you can see uh, that's associated with all this history. So, yeah, I'm, overall, I'm optimistic. I feel like um, people are, are starting to kind of um, relearn uh, this part of our American history and, and get introduced to it in, in some new and cool ways. That's super exciting to hear, especially I'm a proud member of the American Battlefield Trust, so I'm really happy to hear that the trust is is focused in that region. So we're, we're, we're into the home stretch here. You indicated that, you know, folks who are interested in learning more about the Southern Campaign, you mentioned Buchanan. He wrote a book called The Road to Guilford Courthouse. Uh, if you're interested in learning about the overall campaign, that's a great place to start. If you want a little bit more of the tactical understanding, one of my favorite authors is a guy named Lawrence Babbitts. He wrote a great book with Joshua Howard about the Battle of Guilford Courthouse called Long, Obstinate, and Bloody. But I really would argue that the place to start is with Andrew Waters in this fantastic book right here, uh, To the End of the World, because that is how Cornwallis felt when he was chasing Green. He was going to Green got so much into his head, he was going to chase him to the end of the world. <laughs> if you look behind me, I've got well over 100 books in the American Revolution. And for this to be only your second book on the subject, Andrew, I, I enjoyed it immensely. It's, it's fast becoming a favorite of mine. So thank you very much for writing it. Thank you very much for being on the show today. My pleasure, Ben. I'm, I enjoy talking about this. I appreciate the opportunity you've given me today. I, I just hope... Um, yeah, go out and learn some of this stuff. It's really a remarkable um, period of American history. Fantastic. Well, thank you once again, Andrew, and you have a great rest of your day. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Talk to you soon.